be seated. Last week, last week I shared with you about Rifka Berry, the woman who grew up in a devout Muslim home in Sri Lanka. Age of 14, she gave her life to Jesus and became a Christian. She had a rough uh, early years. Uh, at the age of six, her brother, a couple years older, was flying an airplane. It flew into her eye and she lost eyesight, the left eye. Girls often have a difficult time in Muslim homes, not treated as well as their brothers, which was the case. But after that, she was now handicapped. Her parents just kind of disowned her. She was handicapped, treated her like she was worthless. They'd push her, shove her, slap her. She just hated it. Age nine, her distant uncle came and he sexually molested her. Rather than being angry at him, they were angry at her, like now she's sexually been violated and she's even more worthless. They treated her even worse. Age 11, they moved to New York City then age 13 to Columbus, Ohio, and they were very poor, lived in a poor neighborhood, but she went to school in kind of an upper middle class neighborhood and she wasn't accepted very well though. She said the hardest thing about school was lunchtime. She would sit there alone with her brown bag lunch. Nobody wanted to talk to her, foreigner, blind in one eye. And so she began cutting. She'd go home and just wanted to end her life. It was so bad. Do you know how many people grow up in homes like hers today? Where they feel hated? Maybe they're verbally abused or physically abused or even sexually abused. Maybe a parent is an alcoholic or both. Maybe an older sibling is a drug addict and they're mistreated. Maybe the parents have gotten a divorce, they feel abandoned. Maybe they've been victims of rape. Maybe they feel rejection at school as well. We have a lot of people like that, and then the whole world is kind of upset about terrorism. You know, here in our country, after the, the San Bernardino moment and the machete terrorists in Columbus, Ohio, we're just thinking, where's it going to hit next? And then a lot of people worry about the economy. Can I get a job? Can I get a job that'll support my family? There's a story in the Bible that sounds a lot like our times. It's in 2 Kings 6, 24, if you'd like to turn. It's about the ten tribes of Israel. They broke off from the two southern tribes of Israel, Judah. And their capital city was Samaria. The king of Syria came and laid siege to Samaria. He circled it with his army. And so no food could get in, no supplies. And so the people were slowly dying. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey, <coughs> donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. It, things were so bad, people would pay anything for a meal. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, Lord, the king. The king replied, If the Lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the wine threshing floor? From the wine press? Then he asked her, What's the matter? She answered, This woman said to me, Give up your son so that we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him. But she had him hidden. Things were so bad, people were starting to eat their kids to stay alive. I feel somewhat like today is just as bad. I turn on the TV and I think, just when I thought things couldn't get worse. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. He went along the wall, and the people saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. He said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Elisha was the prophet 
in Israel that had prophesied that there'd be a famine so bad that this would be happening. But rather than go to him for advice, the king thought, I'll just kill him. That sounds a lot like today. A crisis happens. It won't be long you hear somebody blaming Christians or Christianity. I don't know how many people I know who have had terrible things happen and they blame God. Now Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messengers come, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is it not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him? While he was still talking, the messenger came down to him. The king said, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Elisha replied, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seah of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. We'll have so much food in 24 hours, prices will drop to the rock bottom. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. He says, King, you'll see it, but you're not going to get to eat it because you're going to die tomorrow in 24 hours. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to one another, Why stay here until we die? If we say... We'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans, those are the Syrians, and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. They say, why should we stay here and die? Why sit here and do nothing? Those seem like words for our time. We live in times when... Most people don't go to church. Over 50% of the people in the Portland metropolitan area have no religious connection whatsoever, any religious group. Only 17% of people in the Portland city area go to church. We were voted the least church city in America a year ago. Worldwide, only 30% of people claim to be Christians. 2.4 2.4 billion. And it's less than that because many of them are only in name, name only. And we live in a tolerance culture. One of our highest virtues today is tolerance. You let me live the way I want to live, and I'll let you live the way you want to live. You let me believe what I believe, and I'll let you believe what you believe. In that culture, it's not cool to uh, go uh, and say to somebody, you need Jesus. In our culture, nah, you know, sister said, talk about that. And so we've kind of learned, I can go to church, but when I go to school, I keep my head down. I go to work, I keep my head down, don't talk about my faith. So most Christians have just sort of given up on the idea of telling somebody else <coughs> about Jesus. <clears throat> but we at Portland Community Church are not giving up. The stakes are too high. We're not just going to let our culture go down the drain. We're not going to let people go to a Christless eternity. At dusk, they got up, these four men, and went to the camp of the Syrians. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there, for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, ate and drank. Then they took the silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another camp, took some things and hid them also. Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. Like them, we have good news. There's a God. He loves us. He's good. If we get to know Him, we can have meaning in our lives. We can know that we're loved. We can experience power in our lives. We have to share this good news with a desperate world. 
So they went, these four men, and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp and no one was there, not a sound of anyone. Only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we are starving, so they have left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they will surely come out and then we will take them alive and get into the city. One of his officers answered, Have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all the Israelites who are doomed. That's how bad things were. So let us send them and find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go find out what happened. They followed them as far as the Jordan. They found the whole road strewn with clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong fight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So a sea of the finest flour sold for a shekel, and two shekels of barley sold for a shekel, just as the Lord had said. Like the Israelites, we live in desperate times. Like the Israelites, we have good news to share. The church is the hope of the world. The church is God's ordained plan to redeem the world. We bring the news of Jesus Christ, the Savior, the only one who can break the power of sin and darkness and give people forgiveness and a new start. The mission of Portland Community Church is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Our church started four years ago. Rick and Erica Miller were generous enough to give us this property with beautiful buildings on it. Then they were generous to give us another gift to help us remodel, and many of you gave generous gifts, and so we have this beautiful facility. Rick and Erica's vision is to see this place teeming with children and youth. From the day we opened our doors here a year and a half ago, many people from the community have come. Many are still coming. So we are ministering to this community, but we feel like we're ministering to the city of Portland. This church can be accessed pretty well from just about all parts of Portland. And so we have some people in our church that drive as far as 40 minutes to get here. We have a two-pronged strategy. Stephen Covey, in his book, The Eighth Habit, uh, cites a, a survey of 23,000 employees said only 37% have a clear understanding of what their organization is trying to accomplish. Only 37%. Only 20% say they have a clear line of vision between their task and what the organization is trying to accomplish. So what are we trying to accomplish? Let me clarify our vision. To lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to lead people who don't know Jesus into a relationship with Jesus, and then lead them and any others that come to our church who already know Jesus to a deeper relationship with Christ. So what's our strategy? It's a two-pronged strategy. One is what I call inward reach. We take the people God has already given us and minister to them inwardly. We want to help everyone that comes here to develop intimacy with God. We think one of the best ways to do that is by encouraging people to... Spend time with Christ every day. You sit down with Him. You, you praise Him. You confess your sins. You pray through your day. Pray for people in your life. And then you spend a little time reading the Bible. We encourage you to use our journals. Uh, more than half the people in this church do use these. Uh, some use some other Bible study guide. That's fine. And then our worship services are, are meant to help people grow in intimacy with God. Our singing, our sermons. And then we do something else called intentional discipleship. When I started this church, I said, I want this church to build strong with a good base. And so my idea was the first year I'd meet with one guy, share with him everything I know about Christ and following Christ. And at the end of the year, he would take somebody else, I would take somebody else. One becomes two, becomes four. It's slow. Four becomes eight. But, you know, five years down the road, the numbers begin to get large. So, Rick, come on up here. Um, Rick, uh, I met with Rick a couple years ago, and uh, um, 
so we met together and every week and um, Rick liked skiing so that helped it really did you know we both like water skiing so uh, so okay so I'm you know you and I met and then you moved on to meet with Mark Hass where's Mark how'd it go Mark okay meeting with him all right and then uh, and then Mark went to take on somebody else and now you're meeting with Don Morissette so my question is meeting with me meeting with Mark meeting with Don what has that meant to you personally have you grown yeah great so uh, just to go through this quickly uh, the first time that Ron asked me to join him in a one-on-one -on -one Bible study uh, my immediate reaction was uh, heck no <laughs> uh, he scared me Ron um, uh, but seriously I thought it took too, it would take too much time and I was really afraid of uh, showing my biblical ignorance in front of Ron. But I thought about it for a while and um, uh, finally said yes. said, what the heck, let's, let's do it. And it was really a really remarkable experience. And um, so how, how we did these studies, how we prepared for them first and how we prepare for, the, for them today, was we take the, the journal and uh, what I do is uh, each day, I'll read a part of the section that we're getting ready for for the next sermon. And uh, so I'll read the scripture, answer the questions, and for those questions that I can't answer uh, immediately or easily, I use a study Bible. And so it's forced me to go a little deeper in my reading, uh, develop a, a deeper understanding. And then uh, we also uh, read the, uh, uh, practice the uh, memory verse. Ron's pretty big into that with his expectations of memory, memorizing those verses every week. And you're just pretty big. I'm just pretty big. <laughs> you, got, and, you got the one for this week? Uh, I think so. You're not going to challenge me, are you? <laughs> I don't know. I figured you would know it. Well, let me get through this. And <laughs> okay. If there's still enough time, then we can do that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, and then, uh, and then I say a prayer. And then... Uh, as it's gone, it went with Ron, and then with uh, Mark, and now with Don. Uh, we, all, uh, you know, we all have busy schedules, but there's usually a time each week where we can either have a call or an in-person meeting. And uh, we'll kind of go through the same thing. We'll meet, we'll get caught up in life. You know, when you, when you meet once a week with somebody, you get to know them uh, on a pretty deep level. And, uh, and I love that, you know, the development of uh, deep, intimate relationships with uh, good men like uh, Ron and Mark and Don has been important in my life, and I feel thankful for that. And then we'll, uh, we'll take about, oh, 30 or 45 minutes, and uh, we'll start off in prayer with each other, and uh, then we'll answer the questions. We'll go back and forth and do the memory, vor memory uh, verse, and then we'll end up uh, telling each other uh, or asking each other to pray for things in our life, things like our relationship with God, uh, things that are going on with us or our family, uh, and we check in to see uh, how the, if any of our prayers had been answered for the week before. And, you know, over the course of a year, when you look back, uh, God does have a way of uh, really uh, giving you a lot of blessings and answering prayer. Um, we also try to make it uh, fairly fun. Um, Mark and I enjoy a good glass of wine, so we have wine together. Uh, and uh, so anyway... That's, that's how that's happened. The, uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, looking back, uh, it's been well worth the time uh, to, uh, you know, develop some meaningful relationships, like I said, with good men. And I feel like I've uh, gotten a lot deeper in my relationship with God as a result. So thanks for asking me to do it, Ron. Yeah. Ron. Hey, um, I know you have a vision for this church. Why don't you just, I'm in the midst of kind of sharing my vision, and I'll be very specific tonight, but... Uh, uh, what's your hope for the church this year? Yeah, two things. One, that it continues to be a loving and accepting and non-judgmental church that uh, greets anybody from our community that wants to have a relationship with Christ. I think you've done a really good job with that, Ron. Second to that, as long as it's good will, uh, God's will, uh, I'd like to see the church grow to the point that we first run out of chairs and then we grow uh, to the point that we run out of space and we got to move. That'd be a success. How's that? All right. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. All right. Zero. <clears throat>
And then in our inward reach, uh, if you want to look on the back of your uh, Real Thing program, we list kind of our core values, and I'm kind of just working through them. Uh, Grace-filled, loving relationships. We want people to experience what, what Rick's talking about, a very non-judgmental church. You come in, you feel accepted, doesn't matter what you've, you know, what you've done, where you've been. And uh, then we think people can develop these relationships best in community groups. So we have 14 community groups, and about 150 people are meeting in those. Uh, probably 60 people are meeting in our discipleship one-on-one -on -one groups. Uh, so, uh, Dan, come on up here. Uh, so, Dan, uh, you're, you're in one of our community groups, and uh, you go to Men's Morning Watch, which meets on Saturday morning. And so, how, you know, how has that group helped you develop some friendships with men and grow in your faith? Absolutely. Thank you, Ron. Um, <clears throat> I, a brief uh, statement of where I came from. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, this church was built by God for me because it's right next door. And uh, it's not, I live right by the Portland Golf uh, Club right there off of 88th and Chase Ferry Road. And uh, like Ron had pointed out, um, ways and means that you come to church. I, uh, I was at the very bottom of... Uh, emotionally, uh, mentally, and spiritually. And I walked through those doors over there and I, I ran into Sam and he gave me a big hug and I cried and let everything out. And, and, uh, and then I found this thing called a men's group, the, the men's uh, morning watch. And I was a, a, a man of 50 some years old and I had really uh, formed a, a bond. I did in the army and I did in uh, high school and other places, but I never really had a father in my life. And uh, so I found a bunch of men that, uh, the Men's Morning Watch, that accepted me and was able for me to, uh, um, with the help and leadership of uh, John Warner. Warner? Warner? That's right. Yeah. And, uh, on a step-by-step -step basis, I've, I've not started in September, but just the meeting in the morning with a bunch of fellow, fellow like-minded men, uh, it's comforting. It, when you don't have that type of stability and you have a family and you don't have a, a base to go by, it's amazing how God provides that for you, builds you a church and sends you to a bunch of men that uh, have similar problems but that can address your needs and wants and the directions that you need to go to fulfill that relationship uh, with the most awesome God ever. You know, and it says in here, and I just wanted to read um, in 1C13, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, which I, is the... Uh, um, 1C13? Boy, you're really... <laughs> shorthand, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like to get a t-shirt, you know, it says 1C13. I've know. never heard that before. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, 1C13, it, it, in it here it says, uh, um, it says, uh, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And I think that involves also with your mission statement. And, and it, 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 sometimes it's referred to as love, but in the King James Version here it says charity. And charity is uh, love in action, it's a verb. And I, th I find that that Men's Morning Watch uh, is, is, uh, is a, lot of, uh, a lot of direction and love. And uh, they're going to be having uh, here, if I may, a uh, hashtag uh, for the Men's Morning Watch. Uh, they're going to have a steak and eggs breakfast. Uh, and you're all well, willing and... Uh, next week? Next week, we're going to have a steak morning breakfast, eggs and breakfast. And it's going to be the most awesome thing, and I would encourage you to uh, all come. 7 a.m. Saturday? 7 a.m. Saturday. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ron. All right. Uh -huh. <clears throat> all right. We have uh, the second prong is what I call outward reach. Uh, we need to concern ourselves with the community that we've already gathered, people that have come to our church and see that they're growing you know, in intimacy with God, but we also have to reach people that haven't been reached yet. If we put all our efforts on working inward, we risk the danger of becoming insular and, and just doing navel-gazing. 
if we put all our focus on reaching people we haven't reached, we could alienate the people that God has already brought us. So we need to reach out. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus tells us to go. These were his final, some of his final words before he left this earth. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Since his purpose was to reach people who are lost, so it needs to be ours as well. Uh, I've told you before that Jory and I go to the Global Leadership Summit in Chicago every year. A very interesting one, uh, session occurred a number of years back when they interviewed Colleen Barrett, then president of Southwest Airlines. And uh, Southwest Airlines started in 1973. They've been profitable every year since then. And their purpose in starting was to make air travel affordable for everybody. In 1969, only 13% of Americans uh, flew, mostly business people. And so they said, you know, our competition, we're not in competition with the other airlines. We're in competition with the automobile. We want to find people who don't fly, don't ever think about it, and get them in the air. Well, likewise for us, we're not in competition with other churches. I already told you, 50% of the people in Portland don't, don't go to anything. And up to 83% don't go to church. There's plenty of people for us to reach. And so that's who we're trying to reach. So how are we doing that? Well, we do it with a, a thing we call relational evangelism. Uh, over the years, I've seen a lot of people come to Christ. In almost every case, they had a primary reason for coming to church. They met somebody. They developed a relationship with somebody. And then they were intrigued with that person and maybe asked them. And the person shared with them about Jesus and then invited them. That's our magic formula. Uh, Stan Tallinn, come on up here. So Stan is our head usher at 9 o'clock. And uh, Stan had a, a, a wonderful experience this last December. He invited somebody to church and his friend gave his life to Christ. I mean, Stan, what you experienced last year is what I would wish for everybody in the church. Uh, to challenge everybody to bring one person this year. I think we can all bring one person and then have the thrill of seeing the person you bring actually give their lives to Christ. So you had that. But I want you to take us back. How did you meet Bill and uh, get going? Yeah, so uh, Bill Douglas and I uh, met over at... So Bally Bill was at the last service. I doubt he's here now. <laughs> right. Yeah, mm -hmm. And uh, we met at Bally Fitness uh, over on Barnes Road. It's not there anymore, but uh, this was probably about five, six years ago. Yeah, and we had a common interest. Uh, we like to go to group fitness classes and uh, boot camps. Uh, sometimes we'd be there for a couple hours, and we just met happenstance and uh, kind of bonded. Uh, we were kind of competitive with each other. Um, we made some other friends, and we kind of formed a, a group of people, and we just uh, really loved being together. And, um, you know, I'd say... Uh, I haven't had that many friends in my life like these people. Um, I haven't had a lot of close friends. And so this has been um, a really big uh, deal in my life. Um, it's been a, a great source of personal satisfaction and helped me, uh, I think, to be a better follower of Christ. So did, did you ever so, talk about Jesus? Or? So we, we, our friendship, uh, Bill and I and this group, uh, it grew and we started doing lots of things outside of the gym. Uh, we went hiking, we went on bike rides, uh, we went to movies together, all kinds of stuff. Um, religion and politics didn't come up too much in our group. Uh, we're pretty diverse in, our, in the spectrum of our worldviews, some of us. Um, so we really didn't talk about it that much, although uh, over the course of uh, the years, I remember a few times where um, the, the subject of church came up, and I, I said I attend church pretty regularly at Portland Community Church, and uh, a couple of the people seemed a little surprised by that, that, uh, that I would actually go to church, that somebody would go to church. Um, just kind of incredulous uh, that that was, was not in the ordinary. But uh, then, uh, 
about two or three years ago, uh, one of our friends in this group, uh, her birthday fell on or around Easter Sunday. And she lives not too far from here. Um, uh, Portland Community Church was meeting at Whitford Middle School at the time. And I just felt compelled. Um, I love these people so much. And Ron's always diligently reminding us to invite people to church. I felt compelled to have them come um, since they're going to be here. And I invited them. Uh, Bill was the first one to accept my invitation. And I think just about all of them came. And uh, it was a wonderful service. We had a great time. And, um, and then after that, um, Bill uh, started to bring his bride-to-be Mamie to some of our workouts. And so we got to know Mamie. And she's wonderful. And uh, they were just meant to be together. And uh, so I was just elated last fall when Bill told me that uh, he and Mamie were going to get married. And I said, where, where are you going to get married? And uh, Bill said, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe uh, in my office space where I have my accounting firm. But they really wanted to get married in a church. And so I said, uh, well, I think Ron marries people. <laughs> you think? And uh, we have a nice, new, beautiful facility now. Um, I gave him the web uh, site information, um, Ron's contact information. And Bill didn't waste any time. Within uh, a couple hours, I had a text message. And he said he talked to Ron. He and Mamie had looked at the website, and they had an appointment to meet with him. And um, so then, uh, you know, after that, uh, it was just in God's hands. They, uh, they were married here in December. Uh, it was a beautiful wedding, and um, I'm just so grateful that, that he's my friend and that I got to participate in, uh, in that wedding. Yeah, and the course of meeting together is when he committed his life to Christ. So, right. great story. So, yeah, yeah. And Bill, Bill and I are uh, we're going to be prayer partners. Uh, we're going to start doing that, so I'm really looking forward. Discipleship? To it. Discipleship, uh, like what Rick was talking about. I haven't done that, and uh, so that's, that's really cool. I'm looking forward to that, too. All right. Thanks, Stan. Hey, could you open your uh, Real Thing uh, program? And inside, uh, we've put something this week. It says, one guest. Uh, the board and staff are hoping that everybody in the church this year could bring one person. Doesn't that seem reasonable? Um, and we think Easter might be a good opportunity. So Easter is in four weeks, March 27th. And I kind of think the place to begin, if you're going to do that, and, and everybody here can participate, whether you're new or you've been here you know, for the four years we've been here and the first place to start is by listing well who's in my life that probably doesn't go to church probably doesn't know uh, god and you begin to pray for them but first you become aware by making a list so if you do that if you'd make a list i would i, th I would encourage you to do that you can do it right now if you want and not, not listen to the rest of my sermon that's okay with me um, but here's our magic formula one live like jesus two go out and meet other people who probably don't know Jesus. And then three, when people ask about your weird but wonderful Jesus life, tell them and invite them. That's our magic formula. So we're trying to make Portland Community Church a place uh, unchurched people would love to attend. Uh, I write my sermons every week with non-believers in mind. Chuck Tempe plans the service when he leads worship with uh, guests uh, in mind. You, you, can, you can just watch it by seeing that he makes it very clear when we're to sing, when we're not to sing, when we're to stand, when we're not to stand. Sometimes he'll explain a song before he starts. Uh, sometimes he shares about his life. That, you know, there was a time when he was far from God. He didn't know what, he was pretty scared about going to church, but he found him he was accepted. And now he says, look at this, I'm up front in a church leading. Um, all those things help a guest, a, a non-believer, feel comfortable because it's really intimidating to go to church when you haven't gone to church for maybe your whole life. And then we try to be ready for first-time guests. Uh, this is where we need your help. Most people who come to church for the first time make up their minds in the first five minutes if they'd like to come back. 90% of visiting guests will decide whether or not to return based on friendliness. Talk to people. Say hi. We live in a culture that, 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 that says if you don't know somebody, you don't say hi. You, you, you look down. You look away. 
We've got to create a different culture here where if you don't know somebody, you introduce yourself. I mean, the, mo the critical moments are the first five minutes when a person gets here and then the first five minutes after the service. It's hugely important that we talk to people. Hemant Mehta wrote a book called I Sold My Soul on eBay. And uh, he, he, he's of the Jain religion and he thought, before I lock this down, you know, he said he was young, and uh, I've, I've never, I don't know a thing about Christianity. I think I should go to a couple churches just to see, see what it's like. So he went on eBay and he kind of, you know, sold himself. So I'll go to whatever church, uh, highest bidder, I'll come and evaluate your church for you. What it's like for non-believers. And he got people that paid to have him come to their church. So he went to a dozen churches and he would come in with his computer and sit down. But here's the thing. He said, not once... In those 12 churches, did anybody ask me who I was or what I was doing? I mean, people come to church for two reasons. One, seeking God. Two, someone invited them. If they're seeking God, they either want to learn truth about God or they've recently gone through a painful experience. We've got to talk to them or we will not learn about what's going on in their life. All right, the other thing in this outward reach is service. We've put a, a high value on serving this community. This is where the, the property uh, you know, is, and right across the street we have McKay Elementary School, so we, we're trying to do as much as we can to help those students, those, those parents. So about a dozen of you are reading with students, tutoring students, thank you so much. About a dozen of you are working with the backpacks. The school's identified you know, 30, 40, 50 people that uh, probably don't have any food on the weekends in their homes. And so we, we send them home at least with one backpack full of food. Uh, and then we do other things. So I think we're going to be doing the carnival in April, uh, helping them with that, uh, the clean up, cleaning up their property and building uh, in May. Uh, we do these community events uh, just where we serve. We did a movie night a couple weeks ago, and uh, we're going to do an Easter egg hunt on Easter, just things that maybe could serve the community in some way. And then we do school days. Uh, when they are, have teacher and service days, the uh, parents that are working say, what am I supposed to do with my kid? So we provide a school day for, for that whole day, and uh, we've served a lot of families that way. Uh, but but you, could, you could participate in that way, get, in, get, get involved in our efforts with McKay. Uh, you could serve with children, with youth, uh, community groups, hospitality, that's the food, you know, after the service. You could be an usher, you could be a host, the, Smiles and greets people when they come. You can serve up here and worship. You can work in the tech booth. Uh, you know, these three guys back there, you know, there's always needs for more. Uh, you can help with landscaping, cleaning, keeping the building clean. Uh, you can be a parking attendant. There's so many ways you can serve. Uh, and young people, all these things I've mentioned, you can do. Uh, you, you can uh, uh, join in doing these things as well. When you step forward to serve, you're saying, I want to be part of the cause. In the text we read today, four men in besieged Israel say, why stay here and die? Why sit here and do nothing? That is our sentiment. We want to do all we can to serve this community and the city of Portland. And we hope you will join us in the greatest, most life-changing cause in the world, leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can be involved in the most life-changing process in the world, leading people to Jesus. So we thank you for the privilege. Thank you for this church. Thank you for people who have generously given to build this church, the building, and for the people who have come and are serving. You know, if you'd like to just speak quietly to Jesus right now and say, you know what? I'd like to join in on that. I want to take part in something here to help this church do what Ron's talking about. Just tell Jesus that real quickly. Now, Father, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion. We thank you for sending Jesus into the world to die for our sins, to give us new life and forgiveness. And uh, we pray as we take these elements that we would uh, express our love for you and thank you and... Uh, have a, a great uh, experience of communing with you in Jesus' name. Amen.